Hey you guys, I've got a really lovely little game to share with you just now. Uh, I literally just played it. My, it's a 10 minute rapid game. My opponent's rated in the 1300 to 1400 area. But for me, it's a really good example of um, how to attack, when to attack, the importance of attacking. Because it starts out as a really quite normal game. If you, if you, you've probably had lots of games like this that everyone's kind of playing solid, good, decent, reliable, safe chess, right? Um, now I'm starting with this uh, this Retty opening because I've I was actually fishing for a, a tennis and gambit. If you've seen my last video, then I'm quite excited about playing that. So it starts off fairly unusual, I, I suppose. You know, with Knight to F3 and then two uh, quiet pushes by Black, and I take the opportunity to play E4 and E uh, D4. Then two more knights come out. We've got four knights on the board. All fairly normal. I come out, pin the knight. Bishop breaks the pin. I castle. Bishop comes out. I centralize my rook. Okay, so far so ordinary, really. And um, we, we get the kind of position that's been seen so many times before. Now I decide to bring my bishop back. So you see, after black announces his intention and castles kingside, then my bishop's not really doing much here. It's it's just looking through two minor pieces at an empty square on e8. So it's it's not really achieving much. So I bring the bishop back to put it on at least the diagonal where it can play a part in some future attack. Knight comes in to harass the bishop, and I decide to. I mean, there's there's several ways here of. Re responding to this potential uh, threat or capture. Um, one is to do nothing at all. I can just, uh, you know, if the knight captures it, I can recapture with a queen or a pawn. But I decide that it's a good use of my time to at least to prepare future attacking ideas. So lifting my rook from e1 to e3 makes sense because at some point this knight will go and then this rook can come across to maybe g3 or h3 and support maybe my queen and my bishops that are still on the board in some future attacking idea. So the knight goes ahead and grabs the bishop and I recapture with the queen, leaving my pawns all on their correct files. And now a quiet move, a6 is played and I push e5. One of the key things that you need to do when you're attacking a king, uh, particularly when it's uh, castled Kingside is to you, you need to resolve this knight because this pawn is clearly a an obvious target. However, I, I no longer have a light squared bishop, so <clears throat> maybe you know the idea of queen and bishop attacking that not so much. But um, I decide to try and remove this knight anyway, and I figure that after pushing this, even if pawn captures, I've got pawn captures. I can recapture with my d pawn, and the knight's going to have to move eventually. So the knight actually moves straight away, forking my knight and my rook. So I capture and black now has to double up his pawns on the d-file, which is no, you know, great hardship. He can always recapture with d takes e5. So now let's kind of take stock. So it feels like I'm on the front foot now when it comes to being ready to attack black. Um, one big difference is that, that his bishops are pretty well placed. They're covering a lot of squares that I would like to use in my advance. So now I decide to pull my knight back in order to make room for my rook to come across. I mean, my, my knight could be a useful attacking piece, but it's no rook. You know, the thing about a rook is, like bishops and queens, they can cover the whole board in one jump. So the rook's a much more powerful piece, and a piece that not enough beginners and improving players use, make an, a good enough use of, right? So I did think maybe there was an idea of maybe like pushing h3 and then bringing the knight back round kind of like this after the rooks come out <clears throat> but I figured that uh, the, the knight it doesn't have any kind of immediate value and apart from anything else the square the knight really wants to get to is like g5 
and that would be great. If we can get the knight on g5, then, it, for example, if I could just put my knight there now, um, then I've got queen takes h7 checkmate, right? So that's, that's really where the knight wants to be. And bringing the knight round here puts it in the wrong place. I mean, it's, it's then defending these two squares, which are not really that deadly. So I just figured, let's move the knight out of the way, get out of the way. Now, the bishop comes in uh, with a skewer on my rook and my dark squared bishop behind. That doesn't bother me because it gives me an excuse to put my rook where I wanted to put it anyway. Uh, bishop takes, I already pre-moved rook recaptures. So now he's, he's got both of my bishops off the board. Um, but I, again, I still feel like I'm slightly ahead because I've used moves like bringing my rook around here. Um, whereas he's used a move like a6 and it, this kind of stuff does make a difference. Yeah, and, and as you improve and as you get better in, in chess, having the initiative and being able to um, gain tempi on your opponent becomes more and more important. So clearly what I'd love to do here would be to put my rook on h3 and then chuck my queen into h7 with mate, but obviously I can't do that because there's still this bishop on the board. So maybe my knight will have to play a part in the attack. Okay, <clears throat> now we have d takes e5, d takes e5, and f6 is played. So I'm, I'm not really concerned about these pawns. I don't see them making a, a huge impact in the game. However, this e pawn does actually come in rather handy. Um, so then you have to ask yourself, okay, do I want to capture on f6 and allow either his queen or his rook to you know to be opened up and I, I really don't want to do that so my knight now comes back now that my rook has moved across to g3 which is a good position it's pinning this pawn then my knight can come back and and start to play uh, more part in the game and i'm figuring that if f takes e5 i've got knight takes e5 and now my knight is starting to get into this, the corner of the board where it can actually participate in the attack on Black's King. Right? Uh, knights are short-range pieces. They're fairly useless. Well, they're useless in attack unless they are quite close close up. Right? They like short-range combat. So Black plays Bishop to e6 uh, because I guess this, this pawn was actually um, undefended. So on the previous guy, I suppose I could have I could have played queen takes d5 check, which would probably have forced the king to move over into the corner. Um, but at the same time, it you know opens up the d-file complete, and sometimes it can actually be helpful for, to keep your opponent's pawns on files. Um, one case that I can think of in particular is, for example, you can have a pawn right in front of your king. You can have your opponent's pawn right in front of your king, and your king can use that as like a human shield. Because although your opponents could sacrifice pieces to open up your king, they can never capture their own piece. Right? It's illegal. They cannot take their own piece. So to keep one of your opponent's pawns right in front of your king, where he can't capture the king because pawns can only capture diagonally, can, can be useful. Anyway, back to the game. So... Yeah, I could have I could have grabbed the pawn, but instead I, I bring the knight in. Bishop comes there to add a second defender to the pawn, and now my knight is starting to wake, work its way up the board. So it's attacking the bishop now on e6. Bishop retreats, and now because my knight is there controlling e6, I can now push Eddie, the e-pawn, up the board. Bishop comes across to challenge my my queen now. And uh, this, I think, is a kind of a pivotal point in the game. So I need to think, how good is that bishop? Um, how instrumental is that bishop going to be in uh, Black's defence for the rest of the game? Because my goal here is clearly to, to win and to checkmate Black. So I had to think for a while, and I decided that actually, although... Uh, my rook on g3 is actually well placed. Its best use right now would actually be to exchange the rook, so sacrifice the exchange, 
um, get rid of that light squared bishop. Um, and obviously the other advantage is that it opens up the h-file for my queen and my other rook potentially to come in and uh, cause some damage. And I'm also quite happy now that I've got this e-pawn advanced defended by a knight and it, now it's uh, there's, there's nothing on the board that's really likely to challenge it. So, uh, yeah, my queen comes in, captures g6, which is hanging. Black now responds by playing his queen to e8, proposing the exchange. Now, um, a, a trade of queens. Now, because I'm down the exchange, I don't want to find myself in a situation where we're in a, an end game and I've got a rook and a knight against two rooks. Two rooks together can be so, so powerful. Uh, it's not in my interest to trade off material when I'm just slightly down. I mean, I, I do actually have one more pawn than black, but I'm down the exchange. So I retreat the queen here to g3, where it also happens to be looking at the pawn on c7. So black uh, takes the initiative and kicks my knight with his pawn. Now, I move my knight now to here, so now black could capture the pawn, but obviously he can't because this comes with a checkmate threat. So he's got to do something to prevent queen takes g7. And so he brings out his, plays his pawn to g5. This pawn is under threat. Now this pawn could actually be really useful because now my knight's here. If my pawn could then push again to e7, it's still again defended by the knight. So I bring my rook across. Uh, so it's kind of a defensive move, but it's also supporting my pawn in its uh, forward intentions. Here again, maybe this is a s slightly slow move. Uh, rook to c8. Now, there is a tactic here. I could have played knight to d6 with a fork on the queen and the rook. So um, certainly winning back the exchange. And then I'd be a pawn up. And that would be all right. But my intention here is not just to trade material. I want to win the game outright. So I push h4. Obviously, this pawn, this g pawn, is always going to be pinned as long as the king is on the g file. So h4, I could also have considered f4. I did consider f4, but I thought h4 is fine. Uh, clearly, this pawn, pawn cannot capture. The pawn cannot really advance because the queen will just take it with check and then. Where whatever the, the king tries to do, the, the queen would then come in to g7, and I think it's mate, whichever way you look at it. So black has to uh, defend, and does so by evading, uh, breaking the pin, and moving the king across. So obviously queen can't take here. I could take with the pawn. So that's what I actually go ahead and do. I want to open up that king now. Now the king moves in. <clears throat> to uh, g6 and again I, I could still play this move but it would be almost like a sideways uh, action the king's obviously threatening my knight so my knight may have to move so I figure now okay let's let's have a think I can move my knight to here with check um, then so if my knight goes there what's the king going to do the king cannot capture the pawn the king has to move right unless you can capture the piece that has you in check if it's a knight then you have to move right so let's say knight to here king cannot capture the pawn cannot stay there cannot go there that means that the king's going to have to move to one of these squares and it can't be this one because of the pawn so one two three squares and then i've got ideas of maybe bringing my queen across etc so the pawn's actually safe so i can actually go ahead and play knight to h4 check and black decides to come in close quarters with his king and now I move my knight one more time so now this then enables I mean the king cannot capture that pawn obviously so now I've got ideas of maybe queen to h4 check and then wherever the king goes I'm going well the king would have to go there I've got queen h6 and that would probably be, be checkmate as well so you can see how 
the importance here of trying to keep the initiative on every move. So I really don't want Black to have any time to get his forces together, to think about a counterattack, to think about getting initiative. I want to keep um, Black on his heels for the rest of the game. So Pawn captures now. And that obviously uh, leads to a discovered attack on the knight by the rook. So, but I was ready for that, and this is this is the the final move. Yeah, um, knight to g7 with a fork on the king and queen, and that is game over. My opponent resigned. So, yeah, that is the, that was the purpose of this move. I was um, I, I I did actually spot that g7 move, and I was hoping that Black would. Uh, well, basically, as long as he doesn't move his king or his queen, um, or move his rook here, then the move would have worked. So I guess he's thinking so much about avoiding checks, avoiding checkmate, that uh, that he actually missed that. So he captured the free pawn, and then a deadly attack. So in the end, it was actually that that knight, that quiet knight, that had moved all the way back to. Um, E1 that, that ended up winning the game. Uh, yeah, so I just thought that was a really satisfying game and, and a, a nice way to to show the importance of, of having an idea, having a plan, and also being flexible with your plans. But always think about attacking, always think about um, keeping your opponent under pressure, keeping your opponent on the ropes. And if it takes a sacrifice, like you know, exchanging my rook for a bishop, sometimes that can that can make a lot of sense. So, yeah, I just I thought that was really enjoyable chess. Nice little game. I wanted to share. Hope you enjoyed it. Anywhere near as much as I did. See you later.